As we all began service today with music, where we're singing the truth about who God is, what he's done for us in the person and work of Christ, what was your focus? Were you truly focused on Jesus? Like if you were to hold a a mirror up to your heart, your mind during that time, where was your focus? Several years ago, my wife and I lived in Spokane, Washington, and our home church, Life Center. I remember one day we came into church and we sat in the back and I, I, I was getting ready for service to start. And I see the worship team walk up on stage and I'm like, oh no, this guy's going to be the guy who's singing to me, really? He can't belt it like the other lady can. He always picks the songs I don't like. And I was so, I was just like, gosh, can we just fast forward the next 30 minutes and get this over with? (laughs) And uh, the music starts and sure enough, he picks an old song I've never even heard. and, And I'm like totally disengaged. Now, there was nothing wrong with the song. It was a beautiful gospel presentation, but it wasn't what Jason wanted. Song number two was a song I didn't like, and I was so disengaged. And I remember there was a moment where I was like, everybody else here must feel this way too, right? And I looked around the room, and to my left, there was a woman, eyes closed. And from outward appearance, it looked like she was worshiping God with all that she was. And I looked in front of me, and there are people with their hands raised. And, I'm, and I, I didn't grow up in church, and I, the churches I've been to were mostly very conservative, and they didn't raise their hands. And so I'm looking at all these people raise their hands thinking, is there somebody up there with a gun? Like, wh- what is going on here? But they were raised in a posture of submission, reaching out to the Father. And I looked around, and now I can look back on that moment and say, I see all of these people whose focus during the musical worship was Jesus, except me. You see, my focus during that time was not Jesus. It was Jason. What I wanted, the singer I wanted, the the music I wanted. So I'll come back to the question. As we began with musical worship today, what was your focus? And was it truly Jesus. Today, we're continuing our series on worship called Treasure. And uh, you you may have noticed as we talk about worship, this is the first time in this series we're actually going to talk about musical worship. And that's intentional because musical worship is a beautiful gift from God, but it is not the totality of a life of worship. It is an aspect that is extremely important for us in our spiritual walk. But often, musical worship is thought of as worship exclusively, and it is not. It is an aspect of a life of worship. So as we talk about worship during this series, we've defined worship as the treasuring of God above all things that overflows into external acts of glorification. Specifically, when we talk about musical worship, we're talking about treasuring Jesus in song. And, and how the song causes us to linger over great truth in a very profound way. We're created to experience music as human beings in a very profound way. And we linger over these gospel truths in song to treasure Christ more. And as we do that and treasure him and we receive his love and grace and acceptance, it overflows into external acts of glorification. It shows up in our life, in our behavior. So I come back again. What was your focus as we sang gospel truth? Was it truly Jesus? Or were you like me sitting back and critiquing everybody else? critiquing the team for the songs they chose or the songs they didn't choose or, or, or critiquing the, the musicians or, or were you maybe critiquing those around you for, for their w- a worship posture or lack thereof? Or were you maybe standing there feeling self-conscious, like I don't want to raise my hands because I don't want to be seen and I don't want to look like the, the, I don't want anybody to notice me. And was your, was your focus truly yourself? You see that, that false Humility that says, don't look at me, don't look at me, don't look at me. That's really actually pride because the focus is still me. The focus is not Jesus. And so what was your posture? What was your focus? And was it truly Christ? Today, we're going to look at three different places in the New Testament. And we're going to be kind of throughout the New Testament, two epistles. um, And then we're going to be in the book of Acts as well. And 
Uh, I chose these intentionally so that we could see the commands to sing. And then we're going to see a story where it's actually played out in the Apostle Paul's life. So firstly, we're going to be in Colossians chapter 3. Now, a little bit of background before we jump to Colossians. Colossians, the letter, was written to a church in Colossae. And uh, Paul, the apostle, wrote the letter out of concern for the church because there were those who came into the church and they were adding to the gospel. And so Paul, for the first several chapters, he just expounds on the unadulterated gospel. Here's the truth of the gospel, the grace of God in Christ and nothing else. And then in the latter parts of the book, he kind of switches it. Now, because of the gospel, here's how we ought to live. And in chapter three, he talks about putting on the new self as you are, have a new identity. You are a new creation. What does it look like to live within that? We're going to pick it up in chapter 16 for our context here on musical worship. Three, Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. So I'm going to pause right here. He says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. That word let could also be exchanged with the word allow. This is a choice. If we want the word of Christ to dwell richly in, inside of us, it, it is a choice. We have to choose to allow that to happen. He's going to expound here in a moment in a greater detail on what that actually looks like. But I want to pause here on this word let. Have you let or allowed the word of Christ, the, the message of the gospel to dwell richly in your life? You ever been envious of someone else's walk? Man, they just have such a rich, deep walk with Jesus. They don't have access to resources you don't. It's not like they've tapped into some special blessing from God. They have just done this. Let or allowed the word of Christ, the message of the gospel to dwell richly within them. So have you done that? Paul continues on what this actually looks like, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. Now, I, I'm going to put the rest of the verse up here in a moment, but if you stop right there before the comma, this looks like, man, we need to get uh, nitty gritty and nerdy with the Bible. We need to get into the, the Greek and the Hebrew and the Aramaic. We need to get out our systematic theology books and commentaries and let's get together in a Bible study and go deep, right? That's where my mind goes when I see this. Or we need to sit under great teaching. And those things are awesome. And we should do those things. That's just not what Paul is talking about here. Look at how he continues. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. He doesn't say, get out your Bible and study. He doesn't say, go to a richly theological in-depth teaching. He says, one of the ways that we allow the message of Christ to dwell richly in our hearts is through song, through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Psalms, the, the, the book in the Bible that have songs that are written to God. Some of those are laments and some of those are, are joyful uh, celebrations. But there's authenticity in the Psalms. And here he's saying, sing Psalms, bring your authentic self to God. Hymns, these are often songs that are uh, rich theological gospel truth put to a cadence and a melody and spiritual songs. And he broadens the category here. And he says, all of this is to teach and admonish you in the gospel that it might dwell in you richly. Here's what I want us to pull away from this. Singing to God is part of our discipleship. Singing to God is part of our discipleship. Let's go back to it. Don't just take my word for it. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. That's being transformed by Christ as the gospel dwells richly within my heart. The transformational process of discipleship happens. And he says, this happens by singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And, and to be honest, there's two kind of ways that people interpret this passage. The first is everything in front of the comma, uh, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom is one command. And then after the comma is a separate singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness to God in your heart. And I was listening to a, a sermon by Bob Coughlin, who is an expert when it comes to worship. 
And he says, no, if you look at the original language here, what Paul is trying to communicate is how we let the word of Christ dwell in us richly, how we teach and admonish one another is singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. The ultimate end of our theology should be worship always. So we don't just build up our a rich theological uh, a construct without it leading us into worship and praise of our Savior. As I was preparing for the message, literally right before we started recording, Leah Beach uh, from my campus sent me a text message. I want to read this. This is a great quote, and I think it very uh, apt for what we're talking about. This is a quote from a theologian named Gordon D. Fee. Here's what he says. I begin with a singular and passionate conviction that the proper aim of all true theology is doxology. If you don't know what that word is, it's, it's, a, it's a word that connotes praise and worship to God, musical. The proper aim of all true theology is doxology. Theology that does not begin and end in worship is not biblical at all, but is rather the product of Western philosophy. Well, if that's not a soul punch, I don't know what is. So as we are discipled, we cannot neglect this important aspect that singing to God is a part of our discipleship. So do you engage in that? God wants us to be a community that's shaped and formed by music. Think about any genre of music. Is not the community that listens to that shaped and formed by that music? Punk rock, right? The early punk rock movie in the 70s and 80s. They were singing about rebellion and anarchy. That community was formed and shaped by that. As a teenager, I grew up in a, in a, uh, a, a communal scene of music that was like screamo and hardcore and punk. And I know that may come as a surprise to you because I grew up in Roseburg and Roseburg is not a bustling metropolis of musicians, but there was a lot of like underground screamo punk bands at the time. And whatever the guy on stage was screaming and yelling at us shaped and formed the kids who were in the audience. And a lot of it was death and darkness and depression and suicide. And, 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 and we were all shaped by that. It reflected in our clothes. It reflected in our language. It reflected in our relationships. Music has this profound influence over cultures and over people. It shapes and forms them. And here God is saying, I want my people to be shaped and formed by spiritual music, by gospel music, because it is a part of their discipleship. And he takes this very seriously. Over 400 times in the scripture, we see references to music and singing. And actually 50 times, you and I are commanded to sing. Here's just a smattering of verses from Old and New Testament. Old Testament, where God is commanding the Israelites to sing. And New Testament, where we are commanded to sing. God himself is said to sing over his people. Jesus himself, as he's looking towards Calvary, hours and days before he dies, he sings a hymn with his disciples. Jesus was a man with a song in his heart. And so Paul here says, God wants us to be shaped and formed by music that elevates the glory of the gospel. So as you think about the music you listen to, the music your children listen to, what is it shaping you into? Is it elevating God? Is it treasuring Jesus? Or is there another gospel in those songs? So Paul here, he, he kind of outlines the foundation of why we ought to sing as a part of our discipleship. And then in Ephesians, he uses very similar language. It's just a very different uh, emphasis. And so I want to jump to Ephesians chapter 5 and a little bit of background before I read the text here. Ephesians 5 uh, Paul is writing to a culture. At the time, there was a cult that had big sway in Ephesus. It was called the cult of Artemis. It was one of the ancient wonders of the world, the temple to Artemis. And, uh, and, and here's how they worshiped. As we've talked about worship throughout the series, here's how the cult of Artemis worshiped. Drunken orgies. They were led mostly, uh, uh, historian, biblical historians believe, they were led mostly by priestesses, 
who would uh, lead these drunken orgies. And that's how they would worship this false god, Artemis. And so when Paul's writing to the church in Ephesus, he's, he's going to write in such a way that elevates the truth of the gospel that would counter what their culture was experiencing. Listen to how he words this. Ephesians 5, 15. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Now remember their culture. This cult, that is how they worship, get drunk and, and have sex. But here Paul says, no, that's not gospel worship. That's not gospel life. Because of the gospel, you've been redeemed from that garbage. You've been redeemed from that bondage and sin. And now you've been set free. And he's going to expound on what true worship really looks like. Instead of being drunk on wine, be filled with the Spirit. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Does that sound familiar? Right? We just read that. Singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul speaking into this culture that would have been familiar with the drunken orgies that worship Artemis. He says, here's what true worship really looks like. Being filled with the spirit, not wine, and singing songs to your God about his glory. Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Here's what I want us to pull out of this. Singing to God is evidence of the Spirit's filling. Let's come back to the passage. Singing to God is evidence of the Spirit's filling. Come back to the passage here. Verse 18, he says, Be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. He says, the command is, be filled with the Spirit. And the evidence of that follows addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. So he he addresses this powerful moment. Be filled with the Spirit. And I want to do a little bit of work here because some of us in the room are like, wait, hold up. We just did a series on the Holy Spirit and you said the Spirit lives in us. How can I be more filled with the Spirit? Being filled with the Spirit is allowing his presence to impact every area of our life. Being filled with the spirit is allowing his presence to impact every area of our life. Now, as I say that, notice that I use the word presence. He didn't go anywhere, but we can deny his presence and deny submitting to his authority in our life. This is a greater level of submission. And actually, a really interesting thing, as I was kind of unpacking this with Pastor Drew, he's got this gold-plated and awesome uh, edition of the Bible software Logos. He's got a, a level above me that I don't have access to. And so he's looking up stuff on, on the Logos. It's not really gold-plated. That was a joke. But it's, uh, he's looking up stuff on Logos, uh, which is a Bible software company. And, and he's, he said one of the commentators had a really interesting insight to this passage and that there's a cyclical nature to what Paul is talking about here. Firstly, we're called to be filled with the Spirit. And as we're filled with the Spirit, that comes out in singing song. As we sing those songs and reflect on gospel truth, it will cause us to be greater filled with the Spirit because it will, as we marvel at the gospel, the grace we've received, we will want to yield in joyful submission more fully to the Spirit, thereby being filled more with the Spirit. There's this kind of cyclical nature to what Paul is talking about here. And so as we look at this, being filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Notice it says addressing one another. This is a communal exercise. Why do we gather every week and sing songs? Because we're doing this. We're addressing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs as we're filled with the Spirit. And Paul continues on here. He says, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. That's such an important phrase right there. The heart here, the original word means all of my inward self with my heart. No falsehood, no pretense. 
And here's how I think this maybe sometimes can come out in, in church. I think there's times where in worship or in private worship, because when I talk about singing, when I talk about worship, musical worship, I'm not just talking about Sunday morning. Yes, that's an important piece. But we should also have private times of worship where we're alone with Jesus in the, in the car or in the house, and we're just treasuring him in song. And so when he says the heart here, it means not falsehood or pretense. And I'm guilty of this. Sometimes we'll be, we'll be in church and a song that I really like comes on. And I start singing it because I like it. And I'm not reflecting on the truth I'm singing. I'm just enjoying the song. But there's nothing wrong with enjoying it. But I'm not worshiping because I'm not reflecting on the truth of the words and the gospel therein. And thereby treasuring Jesus. I'm really just treasuring the song itself. And so... Do you sing from your heart, from all of your inward self? And what might that look like? To to have a posture of bearing your heart to the Lord in worship. For some, it's raising hands. For some, it's it's a quiet submission like this or eyes closed. For others, it's sitting down and, and praying through as you're listening to the music. Whatever that looks like for you, do you feel free to function in that space where you're worshiping from the heart with gratitude? So we're called to sing as a part of our discipleship. We're called to sing. It's an evidence of the Spirit's filling. And Paul, he he addresses the churches and tells them you should sing. But he's not a guy who doesn't walk to walk. He doesn't just talk to talk and say, hey, this is good for everybody else, but uh, do as I say, not as I do. Paul was also a man of song. In Acts 16, Paul and Silas are out there spreading the gospel. They come to a place called Philippi. And in Philippi, there's a a young girl who's been trafficked by some slave owners. She's got a demon that's possessed her. And this demon has given her a spirit. uh, It's a spirit that can uh, do what's called divination and fortune telling. And so people are coming to her and paying for her to tell their fortune and her slave owners are making massive bucks off of this girl. And when Paul and Silas come to Philippi, this girl starts following them around and saying true things, saying this, these, these guys are followers of the most high God and they know the way to salvation. And it's a really interesting interchange in the, in the passage. I encourage you to read all of chapter 16 in Acts and, and look at this story for yourself. But it says in a moment of annoyance, Paul turns around to this girl who's demon possessed and is shouting as they're trying to minister and rebukes the demon within her and the demon leaves. This girl's just been set free. This is a beautiful freedom that the gospel brings. Now, what would you expect the hearers and, and, and the people who saw this happen? What would you expect their posture to be? What would you expect them to feel and think in this moment? I would think, man, the gospel is powerful. The God that these two worship just set this girl that we all as talents people know, they set her free. That is far cry from what actually happens. As her owners see what happens, they're not happy. And they actually drag Paul and Silas in front of the rulers. And here's what happens. Acts 16, starting in in verse 22. The crowd joined in attacking them and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Talk about an unexpected response. These, the people who own this girl, they're no longer able to make money off of her. They're no long, a, longer able to traffic her in the way they used to. And so they're angry. They bring Paul and Silas before the magistrates and rulers, strip them naked publicly, and then begin to beat them with rods for sharing the gospel and setting a woman free. And then on top of that, after they're naked and beaten and bloodied and bruised, they're taken into the inner prison where the thugs were kept and put in stocks. Now these stocks weren't just to keep people to the ground. They were actually intended to inflict pain on the person in them. And they would keep your foot at such an angle, your legs rather, at such an angle that they would cause excruciating cramps. 
So Paul and Silas are out sharing the gospel. And here's what happens. They're stripped naked, they're beaten and imprisoned. And as they sit there, bleeding out, bruised, and, and imprisoned, what, would, what do you think their response is? Like, what would your response be in this moment? That's a hopeless, desperate situation. To be honest, I'd be like, God, what's going on? We were out sharing the gospel. The power of, of Jesus set this girl free. How are we now imprisoned? That's not their response. Look at this. Verse 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. Their response in the midst of excruciating pain and and humiliation and imprisonment is, is to sing songs to God, hymns that have rich gospel truth to God. These are people who truly treasure Jesus above all things, above their life even, above their physical freedom even. And here they are imprisoned, worshiping together their God. And look, it's, it's interesting that Luke here includes in his account, the prisoners were listening in. All the other people who are in hopeless situation there are listening to these two men worship their God. And here's what I want us to pull away from this. And the last point here, as we kind of try to lay in the plane, singing to God restores hope. Like here they are in an awful situation. And, and it would make sense for fear and anxiety and terror to take over. And God has created our physical bodies in a very unique way to respond to music. There's been lots of research that's been done on how music and, and specifically singing with others affects our physical body and the chemistry that's going on therein. So I want to tell you what's going on inside of Paul and Silas in this moment, how God is restoring their hope. Firstly, when we sing cortisol, the, le- the, the chemical that's linked to anxiety is decreasing. And the chemicals that are are linked to trust and building strong bonds, endorphins and oxytocin increased. Literally as they're in prison, God is doing brain chemistry on these guys. And their anxiety and fear as they worship God is decreasing. And as they worship in song, their trust and their bonds together in the gospel and to Jesus in the gospel are being strengthened as they evaluate and reflect on and repeat in song beautiful truths of the gospel. God's doing some awesome scientific work inside their bodies to elevate their hope. Singing to God restores hope. It certainly did for them in their situation. And whenever, I know for me, whenever I get stuck and I'm and, and, uh, and in a kind of a hopeless place, I often want to listen to hopeless music. And a while back, as I was talking to my friend Zach, he said, he asked me, what are you listening to? Like, what, what music are you allowing to form and shape you? And, and I was honest. I was listening to depressing music. And it was this reminder that what I listen to is shaping and forming me. So what is it forming me into? Is it lifting up my hope or not? And so in, in this despairing situation, Paul and Silas' hope could be restored because they worshiped their God. And if it works for them in prison after being naked in public and being beaten in public, it certainly will work for you and I. But that's not where this story ends. You see, Paul and Silas, they're in prison. They're worshiping and something profound happens. Verse 26, and suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundation of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer, not jeweler, jailer, (laughs) woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. Here's what's happening. There's this kind of localized earthquake. It seems as though it's just the prison that's shaking. And all of the doors open, all of the shackles open, all of their bonds have been released. And all the prisoners have been set free. 
And the jailer wakes up and he sees this thing that's happened and he's ready to commit suicide because he knows that the, the, the consequences for losing the charge of your prisoner was death. And look at what Paul says here. But Paul cried with a loud voice, do not harm yourself for we are all here. This statement requires such gospel transformation. This jailer was probably a party to the beating, humiliation, and imprisonment that both Paul and Silas experienced. And here he says, don't harm yourself. He, he is, uh, uh, his, his, this is his abuser and, and his captor. He says, don't harm yourself. Verse 29, and the jailer called for the lights and rushed in and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who were in his house. So here's what's happening. Paul and Silas could have been totally distracted from the gospel in this terrible offering moment of awful moment of suffering. But they treasured Jesus. They didn't get off mission. They worshiped him in song. And it has profound ripple effects. And they didn't sing so that they could be freed from prison. They didn't know that would happen. They've never read Acts 16. They didn't sing to be freed. They sang because of their freedom. That they've been set free in the gospel from sin, from Satan, and from the grave. And because of the great hope within them, they belted out in worship. Their external reality was awful. Their internal reality was awe filled. I know that sounds a little cheesy, but it's so true. They were experiencing immense suffering and yet they were magnifying and in awe and worshiping their God. So as we close the message today, I just want to come back to the question I asked at the beginning. How do you engage in worship? When we come together as brothers and sisters with one voice uh, and one accord shouting the praises of our God. This is a beautiful moment of unity. How do you engage there? And then do you have private moments where it's just you and the Lord and you're on your knees or you're in your car or you're at home and you're just worshiping him because of his greatness? We're commanded to do so for his glory and for our joy. I'm going to release to the campuses. I love you guys. All right. Thank you so much for sticking around. It was a joy to be with you uh, today. And, and I just want to leave us with a couple challenges. Like as, as we process this for ourselves, what, what is, uh, what's the next step? How do we take what we've heard from several different places in the New Testament today and, and apply it to our lives? And the first question, just an evaluative question. I asked this a couple times throughout the message. Is musical worship a part of your spiritual life? It's very clear from Colossians that it's supposed to be. So is it a part of your spiritual life? And if it's not, um, I highly recommend that you uh, begin engaging in that. Now on, on the outline, there's uh, under the resources part, there's two songs that have meant a lot to me. King's Kaleidoscope song 139, which is just basically Psalm 139 put to song. And then... Um, uh, another song by a band named Citizens called Good Ground, where it takes the parable of the sower and the, the vine and the branches from John 15 and just makes a really beautiful proclamation of, I want to be good ground, God. Make me good ground. And so if you don't listen to worship music and you need a place to start, try those songs. Um, but begin somewhere, all right? And the second thing is, maybe you do listen to worship music. I, I want you to share a worship song with someone this week. Could be with your children or your spouse. Could be with a trusted friend. But, but share a worship song um, with someone you know and love today. Let me pray for us. God, thank you that you are worthy of our worship. And I pray as we endeavor to grow in this aspect of our discipleship, God, that um, you just bless us. You'd encourage us that, that music um, how you've created us, that we would respond to your grace and your glory through song in beautiful ways. And I pray uh, for the families as they, as they have conversations about how do we incorporate this into our life in a greater way. You just give them wisdom.
on how to do that in their home. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you guys so much for sticking around. I love you. Have a good Sunday.